However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will ri arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed, blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know if this is like a weird pastor thing, but I put myself in these situations where what would you say if you knew you had just like a few seconds to say it before you died? Like what if you were on a plane and you knew it was going to crash? Like do you just tuck and drop or do you actually like try to share the gospel with people and like do like the crazy street preacher thing on the plane as it's going down? Is that just me? Is that like a weird pastor thing? Or, um, but anyway, or on your deathbed, do you ever think, if, if you're still cognizant, in, uh, what do you say? Like if your family's gathered around you, what are the last things you would want to say or leave them with? Well, this section's interesting because th this is literally the last thing Paul ever says to these pastors he's been working with in Ephesus for many years. Uh, he knows he's going to die. He knows he's heading to Jerusalem. He's had enough prophetic insight to know that he's going to die there. This is it. He knows he's never going to see them again. And so we're looking at the last words that he says to these friends of his. And, and it's also unique in that this is the only time we see Paul preaching to, to Christians. Usually he's preaching to non-believers and trying to convince them of why they should become Christians. Now he's talking to several sets of pastors, probably pastors of home churches in Ephesus, exhorting them um, of how they should live their lives because he's this is the last chance he gets to talk to them again So it's a pretty powerful set of verses, but just keep that in mind You know, these are Paul's last words to these people these men um, As he exhorts them to care for their churches uh, in Ephesus and it's interesting when we talk through the book of Revelation You kind of see how the church in Ephesus fared because it's one of the first churches you look at and a lot of what Paul said would happen actually did happen historically which is interesting as well. So I call this In This Together. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about mission a lot here. I mean, it's our, it's our mission statement, you know, to help all people see the beauty of Jesus more clearly so they can live on mission more fully. And sometimes you can kind of beat a drum too much, and I don't want you to think, wow, Michael really needs to chill on this mission thing. It's in the text, all right? The one thing about preaching the Bible is, like, you kind of preach what the text says. You can't really dodge it. And over and over again, we see mission, to me, this is what I see over and over again just popping up, is what is our job as human beings? What is our job as Christians? What has God called me to do with my life? And is there a higher meaning to it, a higher call to it? Is there a higher purpose to it? And um, so there's three things I want to look at based on what Jared just read. Uh, the mission of all people, the mission of elders or pastors, and then the mission of Jesus. Um, a mistake that's quite common is just to assume that ministry stuff is just for pastors and professional Christians to do. Um, in Ephesians, it says that God has given the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers, to equip the saints, that's the, that's the church, to do the work of the ministry. So ministry is actually the job of people who aren't professional pastors. A pastor's job is to equip to protect, to feed spiritually, to make you strong so that you can go out into the world and reflect the love of Jesus to all people. 
So ministry is a, it's very much an inclusive thing that we're all supposed to do if you're a Christian, not just my job. I have a job to do, but you also have a job to do. And so that's what we want to look at in the text. And so the first thing, verse 24, as Paul is talking to these, these elders, he starts talking about the things that he's done for them and the things that kind of um, encapsulate his life, what he's passionate about. And they're a reflection of what we're all called to do. And so one, he says in verse 24, one of my jobs that I didn't stop doing is to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And so testify, um, it's dia mar turumai, which means to testify, to attest, to protest, to witness. So part of my job, he was saying, part of all of our jobs, if you call yourself a Christian, is to testify to what? To the gospel, that's the good news of grace. Grace is a gift, it's charis in Greek, gift or favor of God. And so he's like, my life, what I've given it to, the, the main foundation, the summary of my life, is to testify to the good news that God wants to give you this gift of eternal life. He's like, I've made that my aim. Every word, how I live my life, always had this goal to let people know that they're very much loved by God despite their background, despite their sexuality, despite their career choice, despite anything, they are loved by God. And not just loved by God, but God proved that love by dying for them on a cross. Because there's one common denominator, and this is the backdrop of what Paul's saying, is the fact that we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. Anytime someone says, why should, if you believe in heaven, why should I let you in heaven? The answer is always, we say it a lot, because I'm what? Because I'm a blank person. What is it? Good. good. Everyone always assumes they're good. And as I said, yes, we can do some good things. But if we're honest, we do a lot of terrible things at the same time. At least think it. I mean, you know, you remember that movie Liar, Liar, like Jim Carrey, he couldn't he had to tell the truth, and it got him in all sorts of trouble because he spoke his mind. We can hide what we really think, and we do it all the time, but the Bible says God sees it. He sees all of it. Like the purpose of the Ten Commandments was to show that you can't keep Ten Commandments. And then I had a friend once, he's like, dude, yes, I can. I, told, I don't murder anybody. I've never committed adultery. I don't really lie. And then, well, when Jesus kind of preached the Ten Commandments, he kind of made it harder. He's like, oh, yeah, you've heard it it's said you don't commit adultery. Well, if you look at a woman lustfully, same thing. Oh, you've heard it said you don't kill anybody. Well, if you hate someone, same thing at the core. And so Jesus made it impossible to keep the law. But that's the point. It's to show that you need someone to keep it for you, and that's the whole idea of Christianity. Jesus did what you couldn't do, lived the perfect life that you could never live. And then, since God is a perfect judge and he has to do something about our sin, instead of judging you, he judged Jesus, and that's the whole cross thing. And so that's the good news, that you're forgiven. You confess your sins to God, he forgives you. He doesn't keep a record of it. He's paid for it. God can't accuse you of sin if Jesus paid the penalty of your sin. Does that make sense? And so that's what, so, Paul said, that's what I testify. Part of my life, I testify to that. I talk about that. Anybody wants to listen to me? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm living for. And then he says, and I also, verse 25, I proclaim the kingdom. Proclaim, caruso means to preach. And the kingdom, basilia, where we get that basilico, that church word, it's the rule and the reign. So he's like, I don't just preach about this gift of God, this, this whole thing where God forgives us. I preach the kingdom. I preach the, the thing we long for more than anything. This is a great quote by C.S. Lewis, who's a writer. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Like, if you find yourself longing for more, you find yourself longing, and I always, like, break this down, but, like, it's interesting how as human beings, we're always wired for, for something better. Like, I just went to Costa Rica. It was really nice. It was like a vacation. Like, why do we want to go on vacation? Like, why are we wired like that? Like, well, why do we want to take weekend getaways? And we pick nice places to go usually, right? 
Like usually you don't go like a weekend getaway in the Bronx. Usually you want to go past the Bronx into Westchester County somewhere. Like if you like the Bronx, I'm not hating, but I'm just saying you pick a nicer area. I go to Hawaii, if you can afford it, the Maldives, Indonesia, Bali. You pick these beautiful places. They're people that make a lot of money just by having Instagrams that show you all the cool stuff they get to go and they, they get invited to it. So that's their living. Why? Because we long for those things. We long for paradise. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. You long for paradise. You long for peace on earth. People are obsessed with two things in our culture. It's usually utopia or dystopia. Like you long for this perfect scenario or you're really drawn to the opposite when everything just breaks down and sucks. That's why like, you know, Walking Dead had its moment and then um, The Last of Us had its moment. But we're just kind of obsessed with both things. Why? Why do we want paradise? Why do we want peace on earth? Why do we want, you know, th this, this place of reunion? Like part, part of de death is sad because you're not seeing someone again. The relationship ends because they're not tangibly present. The Bible says the hope of heaven is resurrection and, reun and being reunited. And, and, and that resonates, right? Like I watched this really, you know, I have like a, a background in science and I watched this thing on the, have you seen the fantastic fungi, uh, the, the fungus documentary? You're like, wow, you were lame that you watched documentary <laughs> on fungus. It's really interesting. But the guy goes a little far. He's talking about just how like, how like amazing the, the fungus kingdom is. But then his hope of heaven is like, and you know what happens? Like, like mushrooms are decomposers. When you die, and, and there are people in the audience crying about his little sermon. He's like, you decompose and the mushrooms absorb you and you become part of the decom de decomposing kingdom of fungi beneath the ground. And I'm like, that is the lamest hope of heaven. I mean, there's a woman crying in the audience that really moved her, but I'm like, dude, is that how low your bar is set? That decomposing fungus, that, that's, that's hashtag goals? And I'm like, maybe for some, but I'm like, what if I told you that it gets better than that? You can hope for more. You can hope for a restored kingdom. You can hope for justice once and for all, where people who got away with stuff, they don't, it's, it's all brought into the light. So perfect justice, perfect reunion, all your loved ones return to you forever. Food, the Bible always talks about feasting in heaven. We like food. Imagine food without food allergies. Imagine food without calorie concerns. Food without bloating, no such thing as IBS or anything else like that, any negative side of food. It's just eating. Well, the Bible kind of paints these beautiful pictures of this is what heaven is. This is what we long for. That's all part of the kingdom that Paul preached. So part of it was he testified to the gospel of grace. Part of it was he proclaimed the kingdom like, hey, there's a better kingdom out there. This isn't it. The reason you long for more is because there is more. Does that make sense? So there's two areas that Paul dedicated his life to. And then he also declared the whole counsel of God to announce, to recount. And then boule is the counsel. It means the purpose or will of God. So Paul's life was dedicated and our life should be dedicated to kind of proclaiming those things. Like one, we were meant for so much more than this. This isn't it. And two, yes, you're a sinner and you fall short. But guess what? God has made a way for you to be perfected. And he's made a place, a kingdom for you to be a part of. And it all runs through Jesus Christ. So part of our lives are meant to, if you're a Christian, to reflect that, to live that to look for people in your life who might be curious about that, because a lot of people could care less. And so, no, I don't believe you're supposed to force feed people that message they don't want to hear. But out of your friend groups, there are people who are interesting, shockingly, really curious about that. Like, yeah, I want more. This is frustrating me. Life is very futile. And what's interesting, you can find people who are haves and have nots that experience the same frustration with this life. Because in one sense, if you're trying to let's just pick money and power. If you're trying to acquire both forever, that chase keeps you going, right? You're just longing for the day where you have it all. But what happens a lot of the time is once you get it all, 
then you're really out of luck because you realize, wait a minute, I'm not satisfied like I thought I would be. I have it all. I'm supposed to be happy and I'm not. Why? And you have this existential crisis because you don't know what to do. Well, the answer lies in the gospel. You weren't meant for this world. If you've got an eternal, the Bible says God's put eternity in your heart. That means nothing temporal can satisfy you. No relationship can satisfy you. You know, it's Pride Week, and I feel like one big thing, one of my friends who, who are, you know, in the gay lifestyle or they've, they've come from a situation where they've been persecuted or felt, you know, like hated by family members or the church or whatever, the false narrative they, 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 they follow is that all I need to do is to find love, and then I'll be happy. And I'm like, dude, I don't care if you find a gay person or a straight person. Love cannot make you happy. A human being can't make you happy. I don't care what your sexuality is. Ask any married person who's been married for longer than like any, any amount of time. They'll tell you, no, this isn't it. This is nice, but this doesn't satisfy you. That's why there's a 52% divorce rate, because the, often you go in assuming this person is going to fulfill you and meet your needs. It doesn't happen. Only God can fulfill your needs. So this whole love isn't, no, love if it comes from God is enough. Love if it comes from a person, I don't care who the person is, it's not enough. A person can never satisfy you because a person is temporal. Does that make sense? No amount of money can satisfy you because guess what? You just want to make more because it's temporal. You're eternal. It can't satisfy you. No amount of power can satisfy you because guess what? There's always someone who's more powerful. And then tragically, you look at what happened with the submarine recently. Those are some of the richest, most powerful people on earth gone in an instant. How sad is that? Your money can't save you from death. It can't save you from the unknown. It can't save you from tragedy. And so Paul made it his aim to declare that there was a better way to testify, to point to. Anybody who was interested, he would tell you that you are made for so much more and God loves you and he has a plan for you, a plan to make you whole again, a plan to make you perfect and a destination. And that was what he gave his life to. And then it gets really practical. Verse 31, he says it's also to work hard so you can help the weak. That's why we're here also. So Paul can go super spiritual, theological, right? Kind of mystical, transcendent, you know, transcendent, and then just really practical. Hey, you're also supposed to work hard so you can share. That's what you're supposed to do also. Very pragmatic and practical. And so what does this mean for us? The mission of all of us is we experience the power of the gospel like it's a powerful thing the day you realize that you're loved by God. No matter what, you're loved by God. And then as you experience that truth and that reality, that God loves you despite you, and prove that love by dying in your place on the cross, we proclaim, testify, and declare the story, that's that whole council piece, of the gospel to people. We look for ways to weave that into our conversations and into our lives and our relationships. And then we work hard so that we can help the weak. Paul didn't allow any freeloading in the church. He's like, no, you need to get a job. Why? So you can help people. He's saying, I, don't, I didn't covet anyone's gold. I didn't covet anyone's silver. I didn't covet, anyone, covet anyone's clothes, clothes. I worked hard. There were seasons where Paul was a tent maker and he worked hard. There were seasons where he raised money. It was cyclical how he lived his life. Sometimes he focused just on ministry. Sometimes he worked for all the money he had to make, depending on what the mission he was serving, you know, the place he was serving at. But he's saying, hey, the goal is to work so we can help the weak. The goal is to experience so we can proclaim, testify, and declare. And we remember that our lives are most blessed when we are in a posture of giving. That's the only, that, this is interesting, that, that Jesus is never recorded saying that. It's more blessed to give than receive. So that's one of those things that Jesus said that just wasn't recorded. He, he said it, because Paul said he said it, but it was, it's not in the Gospels. That's just somewhere else through another conversation that Jesus said this. But your life is blessed when you're in a posture of giving not taking. And so what is our mission? It's right there. Experience, proclaim, testify, declare, work, and remember that whether we're giving the truth to people or giving our lives to people or sharing our wealth with people, that giving posture 
is what truly makes you blessed. Does that make sense? And then it moves on. Paul goes on and starts talking about what the elders, what the pastors are supposed to do. Verse 28, first thing, you're supposed to pay attention to yourself, which sadly often doesn't happen. Like Baylor University did a study where 30 to 40 percent of all clergy are obese, not overweight, obese. And so you see it happen a lot where there's a lot of excuses made. Oh, you know, my health isn't important. Uh, it's just spiritual stuff. No, because like if you're dead, then you can't really serve the church. Common sense. Sad, like in Astoria, awesome pastor. One of my teachers, he just died of a heart attack. And I'm not trying to sound crap, but it's tragic because it was self-induced. He was obese and didn't do anything about his health and he didn't care for himself. And now that church is without a pastor and that could have been solved. So with my personal training business, I always give pastors like 50% off straight off the bat if they want to get in shape. I'm like, dude, yes, we'll make it happen. You can pay me like barely anything a month for 24 months. I don't care. Let's get you in shape because I realize you can't do anything for the church. And ironically, the older you get in ministry, often the more wisdom you have to share, but you've got this, this curve where you're dying as you're getting wiser, and that gap is just tragic. And so take care of yourself, pay attention to yourself, and then pay attention to your people, your flock. And that prosecho means to be aware of, to have regard for, care for yourself and care for your people. Oversee, episcopos, where we get the episcopal word, it means to guard. Part of a shepherd, you know, sheep are, you know, they don't really have claws, they don't have fangs. They have like, you know, fur that gets clumpy, like dingleberries from hell that get infected and they die. I mean, I'm not trying to gross. They're just really useless. They're, they're really weak animals. Like they need shepherds on their own, done. They can't do anything. Even a herd of sheep, done. They, they, it's not like strength in numbers. Nope, doesn't matter. Strength alone, nope. Strength in numbers, nope. Sheep are done. So they need shepherds. And so the, the point of the, the, the church needs guidance. It needs protection. And protection from what? Well, Paul warns protection from the outside, which can come from persecution, but protection from the inside, which usually comes from heresy, false teaching. And so he's saying, hey, wolves are coming, Ephesian elders. There will be people that pervert the truth and try to take your disciples and get them to follow what they think instead of what the Bible says. Be aware. And this happened. If you read the history of the church in Ephesus, it had all kinds of heresy come in it and come through it. And then you're supposed to care for them, to feed them, to feed them what? The word of God. That's the main job of a pastor, to preach and teach and to pray and to give counsel. But it's got to be very Bible-centric. I always warn people, if people that I, I'm like, hey, do you know a good church? I'm like, well, just make sure it's a Bible-teaching, gospel-centered church. Not just jokes, TED Talk, you know, like make sure it's bibliocentric. Make sure it's exalting Christ and exalt, exalting the scriptures so that you're fed. And then to be alert, which means to stay awake. And then you have this big dramatic moment where the Ephesian elders start crying. And I'm not like, I'm not trying to be cold hearted, but like emotion doesn't account for anything half the time. I'm just like, they have this like sad moment, but they're the only church that forsook their first love, which is interesting. Those tears amounted to nothing. A.W. Tozer said, be careful not to determine in a moment what it takes a lifetime to prove. I'm not big on altar calls. I'm not big on, like, I've been to churches where they have, like, baptisms, and there's, like, dramatic music playing and lights shining down, and, you know, you're like, I'm going to never make a mistake again, and I'm going to serve God forever. I'm like, no, you're not. You're going to blow it tomorrow. Please don't say these public decorations in this moment of emotion. And I know that sounds hard and mean, but I'm just saying after 23 years in ministry, I've seen all the cycles of emotion. And I just think based on this text, mission means more than emotion. Are you doing what you said you're doing? Are you spending time with Jesus so that you can be reminded of what he's done for you so that you even care to share it with other people? Why? Like, why should we do this? One, because the fold, always, the, the church, it always needs protection both inside and outside. And two, feeding and pastoring. So feeding is the truth, pastoring is the mission, and protection from lies is always going to be something that you've got to protect your people from. I don't care if you're a church in New York City or a church in Rolling Hills, Iowa, or a church in Lithuania. You battle the same problems. 
people often have the same struggles, and it's a pastor's job to do these things. Now, why in the big picture now, as far as the mission goes? Well, first of all, this is what Jesus did for us. In verse 28, he says, he obtained. That word means purchase. He purchased us with his blood. His blood for our blood. So again, I just want to reiterate this one more time. God is not wishy-washy. Where he's like, you know what? I just, uh, I'm sorry you guys sin, and I'm just going to let it slide. He can't, because the Bible says he's perfectly just. If you're perfectly just, if you are justice, you can't let things slide. You have to do something about it. Okay, so that's one conundrum that God has. He's perfectly just, and he has to judge sin. Can't get around it. But he's also love, the Bible says. He's perfect love. So he doesn't want to judge us necessarily. He doesn't want to punish us. And that's why the cross is such a beautiful thing. It personifies love and justice at the same time. Instead of judging you for your sin, guess what? He judged Jesus in your place. And the perfect life that you could never live on your own, the Bible says Jesus lived. He was perfect in every way, shape, and form. So how do you get to heaven? It's easy. Just be perfect. Is that possible? No. So how do you get to heaven? Accepting Jesus into your heart. Accepting the perfection, the gift that he offers you. Because he purchased you with his blood. That's the essence of Christianity. That good isn't good enough. Perfection is required. Perfection is impossible. Only Jesus was perfect. And so when you become a Christian, the Bible says you are hidden in Christ. When God looks at you, perfect judge, looks at you, he doesn't see your sin anymore. He sees Jesus' perfect life. The reformers call this the great exchange. God takes your sin and gives you his perfection. Best deal of the century. Best deal ever. And so to leave us his word of grace, this is the mission of Jesus, which builds us up, the truth, the Bible, builds us up, that's called sanctification, gives us an inheritance, that's called salvation, with those who are being sanctified, a.k.a. the church. So that was Jesus' mission. I'm going to die for these people. I'm going to purchase these people. I'm going to buy them back. I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to take their sin, wash them, make them clean, make them perfect, and send them out into the world so they can reflect me to all people. They can tell all people what I've done for them. They can tell all people how much I love them. And so, end point, last thing, what shall we do? This is a question that people asked Peter when we first started this in early, early on in Acts. And so it's been our point of application. What do you do with all of this? I'll end here. So, Regular reflection on the fact that we are only part of the kingdom and we only have an inheritance because we are obtained by his blood is important. It leads to a life that longs to help other people experience the same gift. And that's what Paul says. Paul says something really weird. He's like, hey, I am innocent. He's telling these pastors, I'm innocent of everyone's blood. That was said earlier, and I think in Ezekiel 8, he said the same thing. He's like, hey, I've warned everybody. It's not on me anymore. I've, sh I've shared this. You're on your own in a sense. You know, if, if like, when we were in Costa Rica, I was telling Lana, they have crocodiles that, that, that are in Tamarindo Beach because there's a river right there. And um, if it's high tide, they can swim into the ocean, which is slightly problematic. A surfer was killed three years ago, and we didn't see any, but I was like, oh, a sea turtle. I'm like, oh, that's not a sea turtle. It was a crocodile swimming by 100 yards out, and he was cruising, so he wasn't interested in us. But I told everyone. I was like the first person to see it. I'm like, hey, is that a sea turtle or a crocodile? The guy's like, oh, that's a crocodile. And so I would have been lame if I'm like, huh, I'm just going to swim in, and you all are on your own because I don't want to be crocodile. But that wouldn't be a good thing to do, right? Usually a decent human being warns everybody if they believe there's a problem. And that's just the basis. Look, when you really understand, you really get that God loves you. You really get that there's so much more. You really find true fulfillment in life. You really find why you were here. You know where you're from. You know why you're here. You know where you're headed. You want to just tell people. It's just natural. And if you don't, 
then you really need to ask yourself, why don't I want to, right? Because reflection on his blood leads to a burden for their blood. I'll say that again. Reflection on his blood should lead to a burden for all people's blood. I was talking to Ryder about this the other day. I've talked to Kate about this before. I've talked to lots of people. Like, this changed my life. The more I understood the gospel, the more I just wasn't okay with where my friends were headed. The more I wasn't just okay with anybody I knew or any situation I was in. It was like if I found the cure for cancer, I want to share it. And I'm not okay with people dying if I know the solution to living, right? And so I think one important thing is to ask yourself, and this is what I'll leave you with, is does the way that blood weighed on Paul, where he's like, hey, I've preached, I've proclaimed, I've testified, I've said everything I'm supposed to say to all of you. Anybody got put in my path, I let them know. I'm good. I've done what I've been called to do. Do we wrestle with that the same way? With the people that God's put in our lives that don't know him, is that mission, that burden, is it there? Enough to where we want to at least pray for them regularly. Okay, maybe you're timid, maybe you're introvert, maybe you're like, oh gosh, I can't do that, uh, I'm not there yet. Oh, do you even pray? Like, is the burden on you enough to where you start to pray in that direction? That maybe God would give you a softball. Where I've had people like, why do you believe in Jesus? I mean, my gosh, oh, I don't know, mm, not gonna say anything, mm, too weird, awkward. And I'm like, dude, the just, guy just asked. I'm not forcing any conversation. They straight up asked me, all I gotta do is give them an answer, right? But has it even started with a, am I even burdened enough to pray? Does this gospel mean enough to me where I'm, I'm just looking for opportunities? Not to Bible bang people, not to be obnoxious and stand in a street corner and tell people they're going to hell. No, in just real organic conversation, am I burdened enough to wanna, do I care? Or do I believe it enough to where I want to tell someone that there's just so much more? I leave you with that. I think that's what Paul, Paul kind of wrestled through. So reflection on his blood leads to a burden for their blood. If you've experienced the hope, you just want to share it. That's the bottom line. All right, let's pray. God, we.